Mark 2, 23 to 28, Jesus is Lord of the Sabbath. One Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields, and as his disciples walked along, they began to pick some heads of grain. The Pharisees said to him, Look, why are they doing what is unlawful on the Sabbath? He answered, Have you never read what David did when he and his companions were hungry and in need? In the days of Abathar, the high priest, he entered the house of God and ate the consecrated bread, which is lawful only for priests to eat, and he gave some to his companions. Then he said to them, The Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. One to six. Again, he entered the synagogue, and a man was there with a withered hand. And they watched Jesus to see whether he would heal him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man with the withered hand, Come here. And he said to them, Is it lawful in the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or kill? But they were silent. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately held counsel with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. Hi everyone, my name is Andres, if we have not met. Uh, I am both nervous and excited. This is my first time preaching on a Sunday, so yes, I'm nervous, but I am very grateful to have this opportunity to be speaking with you both in person and online about Sabbath and rest, following from the great messages that Mike and Becky preached on last Sunday. More specifically, I will be preaching about slowing down so that we can find the light in God. And let me start with a story of my childhood. When I was 10 years old, my mother used to take me on Saturdays to play a chess league competition. And I just loved it. I was really good, actually. So I was winning week after week after week. And my mother and I got into the habit of, after the chess match, going for a walk and having dinner together. having to win in that chess match to be, able, to be able to have that time with my mother, to receive love from her. And that couldn't be any farther from the truth. The reality was that actually, due to family circumstances, for my mother, Saturdays was the only real chance to spend good quality time with me. And I had been missing the point. I had been making it all about me having to earn her love and time with her through winning a chess match when actually she just wanted to spend time with me and delight with her son. And this is the thing that we too tend to do something very similar with the love of our Father in heaven for us. We become unaware of his presence, love, and grace in our lives. We tend to make everything about ourselves, our circumstances, our uh, storms in life, and our performance, rather than about his love, his grace, and the joy of his salvation. And I believe that our fast-paced culture that idolizes hurry, busyness, doing more, wanting more, becoming more, achieving more, desiring more, is one of the key reasons why we become so distracted from God's presence and love in our lives. But God is a generous God that is gifting us an opportunity through the Sabbath and its life-giving wisdom to slow down our way of living so that we can rest in Jesus and in his lordship over our lives, so that we can delight in him. Let's continue by seeing how the Pharisees were also missing the point, both on the Sabbath and on Jesus. 
So in the text that has just been beautifully read before in Mark 2, 23 to 28, we see how the Pharisees were challenging Jesus on whether his disciples were breaking the law on the Sabbath day. An important piece of context about this is that the Pharisees were following the Mishnah to observe the Sabbath. And the Mishnah was a compilation of 39 categories of work that were not allowed on the Sabbath day by Jewish tradition. And this is what the Pharisees were using to challenge Jesus' son. But this is the key thing. It was not God-made law. It was man-made law. So the Pharisees had done the Sabbath that was created by God as a way to reveal his loving, merciful, and generous character into a legalistic exercise to pursue righteousness through man-made law observance, not through faith. So the Pharisees were missing the point big time, but Jesus brings clarity and truth with his response, being Jesus as he is. And he says, the Sabbath was made for man, not man for the Sabbath. So the Son of Man, that is Jesus, is Lord even of the Sabbath. Now, Jesus was saying two key things to the Pharisees, but also to us today. The first one is that the Sabbath is a gift from God to humanity. And the second one is that Jesus is Lord of everything, including the Sabbath, including man, including law, including you and I, including your circumstances. And let's remember, this is the Jesus that actually has granted access to us, to the Father, that has given us our salvation in which we can rest and hope and have joy. So if he is the Lord of the Sabbath, I don't know about you, but that definitely sparks my interest about this Sabbath thing that he is the Lord of. And speaking about the Sabbath, the best definition that I have come across on it is the Sabbath as the enforced rhythm of grace. In other words, the Sabbath is an invitation from a generous God to slow down our way of living so that we can stop having to continuously strive for performance and we can rest in Jesus and in his lordship over our lives. God will not impose the Sabbath on you. You need to accept it and intentionally and grab this gift, this invitation, if you want to live in a rhythm that enables you to experience God's grace in your life. God is inviting you to stop once a week to slow down so that you can remember that He is God and you are not, and that is good. So that you can enjoy and delight in Him, what He is like, and in His creation. So that you can say no to the lie that your worth, your value, is based on your productivity, on your performance, or what you do or what you have, and say yes to the truth that you are unconditionally loved by your Father in heaven through faith in Jesus. Now, I believe that getting legalistic about the Sabbath, about exactly what to do during the day and in which day of the week it needs to take place in would be missing the point. But I must say this as well. If you are completely dismissing the Sabbath and is life giving wisdom in your life, that is also missing the point. It's dismissing a gift, a good gift from a generous God in your life. So you must be asking to yourself, okay, well, Andres, what is the point? Well, I think that we should be asking who is the point? The Sabbath is pointing towards Jesus. He is the point. Jesus is the Lord of the Sabbath, as we have just seen. And it is in him in whom our souls can find ultimate rest. Actually, Jesus himself said, all you who are weary, come to me, learn from me, and I will give you rest. Now, others have addressed in other messages what it looks like to put the Sabbath in practice as a day per se. For the rest of this message, I want us to look at three ways in which we can apply the life-giving wisdom of the Sabbath so that we can come to Jesus, learn from him, rest in him, and particularly, look at this principle of slowing down so that we can delight in God. The first way to slow down to delight in God is through silence and solitude. And a key negative consequence of the hurry and busyness in which usually we get involved in is that we stop being able to recognize how 
all those surrounding voices are distracting us from the truth of God's voice in our lives. And some examples of this is that we are constantly bombarded by messages that say to us that you need to perform to be loved and things ultimately depend on you. Therefore, do not even dare to fail. But God is saying to you, no, 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 actually you are saved by my grace and I am the one that is sovereign, that is in control and in that you can rest. The enemy will say that it's your sin that defines you and that you need to live under shame and guilt. But God's voice says there is forgiveness and redemption in him. The enemy again will be saying that you are on your own, that you are alone, that stop caring for others because they will not care for you. But God's voice says, I care for you. And I'm inviting into my loving family, into my church, Learn to love others and be loved by others through me. And I get it. I'm I'm sure that you are busy and I'm busy too, but Jesus was also very busy and actually with way more important stuff that you and I have to look after. And hopefully you agree with me on that point. But still, still he regularly, and this is a key word, regularly found times of silence and solitude so that he could come to his father, so that he could pray, so that he could abide in his father. Why? Jesus knew that it was absolutely critical, essential, key for him to quiet down all the other voices so that he could more clearly listen to the one voice that truly matters, the voice of his father. And this is the question for you. Are you giving to yourself the chance to remove yourself from all the other noise so that you can more clearly listen to the voice of your father? And equally important, are you waiting there long enough so that you can actually listen to what God is saying to you about it all? I believe that actually some of you today need this important reminder, the voice of your loving father sounds like this. You are my beloved child in whom I have delight. Another way to slow down to find delight in God is by learning to say no, including and saying no to good things so that we can say yes to the best things that God wants for us. And Jesus gives us a masterclass on this in Mark 1, 36 to 37 where we see him after some very demanding, exhausting, tiring ministry time in Capernaum, that he goes to a solitary and silent place to be with his father, to pray, to abide in him. And it's very interesting what happens. We see his disciples finding him there and saying to him, Jesus, everyone is looking for you. Hashtag no pressure, right? The thing is that Jesus was all the time constantly surrounded by expectations from others and with plenty of good options about what to do with his time and with his energy. And that's why it's very important for us to look at how he responds to his disciples there. He says, let us go somewhere else so that I can preach there also. That is why I have come. In other words, no thank you. It would be really good to stay in Capernaum to minister for longer, but I have better things to do that God has called me to, and I want to obey him. Now, as a follower of Jesus, are you, first of all, letting God be the one that says what are the best things that you are to focus on in your life? Or is it you who is driving your own agenda? Or actually, is it the expectations from others that are shaping the direction of your life? And it could be that you're feeling right now listening to this message um, drained, depleted, exhausted because you're involved in too many good things. And actually I'm learning that that is me when I stop asking God what is best amongst the many goods. If that is also you, I have this question. Are you really, really focusing on what is best or only what is good? Actually, a uh, question that I use as a temperature check uh, in conjunction with the other one is, when was the last time that you trusted God saying no to something good so that you could create space for the better things that God wants for your life? 
Remember, if you are a follower of Jesus, that also involves learning to say no to good things. And last but not least, another way to slow down, to find delight in God, is by waiting on the Lord. And here I want to ask to focus specifically on waiting on the Lord when we are in the middle of the storm, when we are going through the difficulties of life. And let's be honest, when we are in the middle of the storm, our tendency is to only focus on the storm and just be able to see it. And we start complaining. We start to lose contentment and we stop being able to recognize everything that God is doing in our lives and that he has given us, including his grace. Even worse, sometimes we sinfully start to rush ahead of God, trying to get out of that storm in our own ways, strength, plans, and timings. Now, I'm not saying that waiting on the Lord is ignoring the storm. But what I'm saying is that waiting on the Lord is choosing to look at Jesus, to trust him, to listen to him, and worship him as we go through the storm. Now, when we wait on the Lord in this way, nothing short of a miracle happens. God's strength is revealing our weakness. His light shines in the darkness. Love covers a multitude of sins, and God's glory, God's glory becomes visible to us in our lives, but also for those around us to see. Now, God loves to reveal his glory and his presence in our storms. Don't miss out on the opportunity to experience his goodness, his love, his grace for you in those moments, in the middle of your storm. Wait on the Lord. So, question to you, this is the previous slide, is when you are in the middle of the storm, what is your tendency? Are you rushing ahead of God? Or are you learning to look at Jesus, trust him, listen to him, and worship him as you are going through the storm with the expectation that God wants to reveal his love and mercy for you in those moments? Now, I believe that we have a God of grace that loves the humble and that is inviting you to repent of where you have let life distract you from his love and grace in your life, either through hurry, busyness, or rushing ahead of his timings and plans for your life. To conclude, my prayer is that rather than missing the point or missing out in this good gift of the Sabbath and his life-giving wisdom, we will learn to embrace this wonderful gift from God and that we will learn to slow down our pace of life so that we will be able to delight in God. And that in doing so, we will become more aware of his presence and experience the glory of his goodness. What a generous God we have that is worthy of all praise and all trust. Thank you. Right. Good morning. Good to see you all. Thank you, Andres. Listening to Andres is like listening to a young, swarthy Antonio Banderas. I'm afraid listening to me sounded more like Del Trotter from Only Fools and Horses, so I apologise in advance. Okay straight into it. This is my first time preaching anywhere in the world, so you've got a world exclusive, just to say. I grew up in the 1970s, I know you can't believe it, uh, and on Saturdays and Sunday mornings, they used to show old black and white uh, films on TV. Now, I love them, I still do. In amongst them were the Westerns, uh, where there was always an inevitable showdown or a gunfight in which good prevailed and the baddies were killed off. Uh, there, the, it was uh, a survival for the settlement with the marshal and the sheriff defending the people, 
the good of the townsfolk. It was a battle of good over evil and truth over lies. And the marshal was usually set up, walking knowingly into a trap, but fearlessly walking into that trap nonetheless. I suggest the scene you read, we read in Mark 3, uh, set here in the synagogue in the days of Jesus, is a showdown, a gunfight over the truth. The truth embedded in scripture and how that truth brings rest, recovery and restoration versus a legalism which robs those under its heavy burden of shouldery and ortery that's a should do mentality and an ought to do mentality and robbing you from the rest you could receive and enjoy now there are a few observations to be made this morning about this passage which I pray will encourage you and cause you to step out in faith and receive all that God wants for you today. Jesus is for you in your weariness. I personally have just been through one of the busiest periods of my life and I just got back from holiday and boy did I need that break. Uh, So I know exactly where some of you are. Some of you are at home as well. Damage done to you or even by you in that weariness caused by those things. He wants to heal and is ready to meet with you and to heal. And that is what the Sabbath rest is intended for. Now, who is this message for? Well, it's definitely for me. And it's for all of us. We can all miss our Sabbath rest. So the story so far, Pharisees are still hounding Jesus, seeking to accuse him of breaching the law, and they would see him and his ministry destroyed. Jesus knows the Pharisees are out to get him from the previous confrontation in the grain fields in Mark chapter 2. But they know what he is doing and what he is all about. He's been doing signs and wonders all over the region of Galilee. In Mark chapter 1, we we hear about his authoritative teaching, amazing the people, delivering people from the demonic and many, many healings. So the talk of the town would all have been about Jesus. But the showdown, the confrontation, now moves to the synagogue. So what was their problem? What was the Pharisees' problem with Jesus and his disciples? Well, by their understanding, Jesus and his disciples had previously broken the law by using their hands to pick grain on the Sabbath. Neither right nor left, or if you're at home, right or left... Uh, should have been used to work. Jesus and the disciples, though, were entitled in Deuteronomy 23, 25. They were entitled to pick pick grain from a field, but as long as they weren't using a sickle to to do it, it was considered work. Now, the Pharisees understood it this way. God wanted the individual keeping the rules, and only that mattered. Only following the letter of the law pleased God. They were blinkered. However, Jesus and his disciples were about his father's business. Healing, preaching, delivering the demonized and helping the poor. Theirs was a pastoral and, pastoral and priestly mission. The Pharisees, on the other hand, were being condemning, unkind and harsh. There was no rule, no rest for rule breakers with the Pharisees. They load, put another load on people's backs. So what was Jesus' answer to their intransigence? His immediate response to the repeated pushback from the Pharisees was to call a man out from the crowd with a withered hand. A disability or injury, we don't know. But the word withered suggested a deterioration over time. He says, come here. It's a call from the Lord to come to him. Jesus is calling. It's an opportunity to obey Jesus' call. Now can we just pause there, just put yourself in the man's position in the synagogue, surrounded by a hostile crowd. You know the Pharisees were against Jesus and his disciples. They're ready to accuse him. 
And now Jesus is calling the man out to come over to him. He would have been nervous about stepping out in front of these men. His heart would have been beating faster, not knowing what was going to happen. He doesn't want anyone to single him out. He doesn't want to stand out. But he steps out anyway. He steps forward. He overcomes his doubts and fears, the doubts and fears raging in his head. And he makes his way to Jesus. I've just got a couple of questions to ask you. Do you have a withered hand? Literally, metaphorically? Are you weary or withered at the end of your rope with a physical impairment or sickness? Are you carrying an emotional load that's worn you down? A broken marriage, a bereavement, even bitterness? Or are you loaded down with a sin that you just cannot overcome? As with the man in the synagogue, you have a choice to obey Jesus' call when it comes. Are there voices that hinder you coming? Are you afraid of criticism or even hostility? Let's just pause and think about that for a moment. Just dwell on that for a moment. Now, has Jesus been calling you? Is he calling you now? Is he speaking to you now? Is he speaking to you when Andres was preaching? Did that resonate with you? Or when Mike and Becky last week were preaching to us? Have you responded? Or are you holding back? Jesus wants you to come out from the fringes of life even church life, from the back row to the front row. So step forward when he calls, you will find your Sabbath rest. Now moving on in verse 4, Jesus draws first in this gunfight with a well-aimed question. Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do harm, to save life or to kill? Well, on the evidence, they knew little, if nothing, of the law. And the Pharisees remained silent. Well, was it lawful to save life on the Sabbath? Well, the answer was, and still is, yes. The rabbi was then allowed to intervene in a matter of life and death on the Sabbath. But was a withered hand a matter of life and death? For Jesus, showing mercy was more important than keeping to the letter of the law. We see in Luke 13, verse 10 to 16, you may remember the story. A woman bound by Satan, crippled for 18 years, 18 long, hard years. And Jesus heals her on the Sabbath, and the Pharisees are in uproar. You've got six days to do that, you can't heal her on the Sabbath. Well, Jesus eventually humiliates the Pharisees. By revealing they break the Sabbath by untying their donkeys, not allowing them to uh, suffer thirst or hunger. And yet they objected to this woman being healed on the Sabbath. Sheer hypocrisy. The attitude is hard-hearted and sinful. And this angered Jesus. Now, William Hendrickson, in his commentary on Mark, says, The Pharisees were esteeming man-made ritualism above God-ordained concern about man's welfare. He goes on to say, Jesus was terribly displeased displeased with those cold-hearted ritualists. But even his anger, even in his anger... It was tempered with grief. Now, it says in the uh, the original text, the tenses, his anger, was momentary. He wasn't really out to get the Pharisees. He's not looking for revenge. This is not like he's trying to uh, do them down. No, he was grieved by their stubborn, hard hearts, their spiritual obtuseness, their dullness, and their obstinacy. Their refusal for their refusal to accept the truth. He was concerned for the Pharisees as much as he was for the man with the withered hand. And that is love divine. All loves excelling. But then 
Jesus does something amazing. Jesus asks the impossible. And Jesus says to the man, stretch out your hand. What? Hey? The man must have said in his heart, are you crazy? I can't do that. It's withered. It's useless. With God, all things are possible. And again, though he may have questioned the request, he knows that Jesus does and has healed others. The man is obedient. He does what Jesus tells him to do. He believes God. And we know that faith pleases God. Immediately, his withered hand begins to function normally. He's been healed from the physical deformity. All that suffering, all the long, weary days, wondering when this would end. He was obedient. He exercised faith. And Jesus ended his suffering. Our question is today, is Jesus calling you to do something that you would say is impossible? Like keeping a Sabbath. You might say, oh, I'm too busy to keep the Sabbath, work, ministry and life should and must be done first. I've got to get these things done. Well, you can't see the wood for the trees. In Matthew 19, verse 26, Jesus declares, With man, this is impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Now, you might be saying, well, you know, I'm unable to forgive. I'm, I'm just so tired. I'm worn out thinking about it. Or well, this habitual sin is just too impossible to defeat. I've been trying for so long. All the things that seem impossible for you today, they can be resolved, healed, and restored. But only if you come, if you step out in faith, believe he can and wills to do it. In do doing so, you will find rest. And it's what the Sabbath was truly intended for. Moving on, we're told in verse 6, the Pharisees left immediately. They made their mind up. And they went off to plot with the Herodians to kill Jesus. And there's a warning here. Legalism and refusing the grace of God could lead you too into dark places. So what can we learn from this dramatic confrontation? Well, it's obedience to observe the Sabbath, but not just for the sake of observing it. The Pharisees missed this. And many opportunities to truly get rest from their works. See, we in our striving, laboring under a misapprehension that God is pleased by our sacrifices alone, can miss Jesus and our rest, our healing. And when Jesus comes and calls you out, be like the man with the shriveled hand. Step forward and receive his gift. Sabbath was made for you to give you rest from striving, carrying a burden you can't carry alone. Time and space to rest. Remembering his great salvation in your life. Now we can enter that grace freely and there is no coercion. He's not going to force you into that time. But this message is a message that sets us free from the need to prove ourselves, our worthiness before him. Because of his grace and mercy, we are all to live out our lives in grateful, joyful obedience. So now what? Is there something we can apply here with regard to how we keep the Sabbath? A few things. Set regular time for Sabbath rest. Create a good habit by making time to remember him. Just a basic pattern will do, light a candle sing songs to him take time to thank him I think he likes that but make it special time however don't make rigid rules around the Sabbath or what it should look like or what it should be if you have a regular Sabbath rest but it's interrupted and you can't fulfill your normal obligations don't fret you don't have to have all your candles in a row to observe the Sabbath. 
Is church experience disappointing you? They don't do this anymore. There could be an element of a Pharisaic controlling. You know, it must be like this to be, for it to be church for me. Is that attitude creeping into your thinking? Just remember what God did for you. It's all grace. He loved you with an everlasting love. He drew you with loving kindness. So get your eyes off how you are performing and get your eyes on the one who is Lord of the Sabbath and who alone can bring you rest. Thank you.